All right, so let's get started here on energy and uh, cellular metabolism. Basically, we're going to be looking at how do we create energy for the cells. Um, that molecule is going to come from ATP. So basically, we're looking how do we form this molecule. All right, we can use our nutrients. We use our carbohydrates, our proteins, our lipids. Um, we can use those nutrients as energy to be able to fuel the process to make ATP. All right, um, this lecture is going to cover parts of four and parts of chapter 22. I will reference the page numbers in which uh, on the module number to make sure you guys are pinpointed on where we're going. Chapter four is going to deal a lot with um, the breakdown of glucose, and 22 is going to be more of the um, uh, breakdown of lipids and protein or amino acid metabolism. All right, so to get started here, though, we got to talk about bioenergetics, okay, energy in the biosystems, okay, because our cells, our cells need energy, all right, like I said, it's going to come from our ATP, but what do we need that ATP for? We need it for breaking chemical bonds, okay, it takes energy to break bonds. Uh, we've already seen it through transport of ions, our uh, transporters. Our primary transporters, we got to use ATP to make those concentration gradients. That sodium potassium pump is the common example we use. It uses ATP to pump sodium out of the cell and put pump uh, potassium into the cell. Okay, so we need ATP there. We mean both movement at cellular and organismal level such as our muscles we use lots when we're working out we're using lots of atp and so that's why we are burning calories we're using that atp we're using the fuel or our fuels to make atp our nervous system needs a lot of atp lots of energy to operate so you see we need our cells need to be able to make this molecule this atp molecule and that essentially is what we're going after is how does a body go about making this so talk about we got to talk about energy sources and some laws of what we call thermodynamics laws of energy in a sense we got two forms we got kinetic energy and that's energy in motion okay molecules moving across membranes an example heat Energy is in motion. This is kinetic energy. We've seen it in solutions, right? Solutions with the molecules bouncing around where they diffuse out. The driving force is kinetic energy in the molecules. Okay, the other is potential energy, and that is stored energy. Our classic example for what we're going to be looking at as stored energy is remember these chemical bonds that we are forming. These chemical bonds contain energy. They are stored energy. We can break these bonds and actually release energy. So there is a form of energy stored in there. Okay, what we can see is these forms can be converted back and forth. We can convert potential energy into kinetic energy, and we can take kinetic energy and put it into potential energy. Looking at the example down here, See the man moving the ball. It is energy in motion. We are moving, the, he's moving the ball up the hill. Okay, that's kinetic energy. The ball is sitting there now, it is not moving, so it doesn't have kinetic energy, but it is sitting at the top here of the crust. Now it has potential energy, it's stored in. There can be, can be transferred into kinetic energy if we get it to start rolling down. Okay, so when we talk about our thermodynamics, we're going to be talking about this conversion of energy um, between these different forms. So these laws of thermodynamics that I'm talking about, it governs basically the transfer of energy in basically the whole in, uh, universe or, or the whole world in that first law of thermodynamics is energy can be converted from one form to another but the total amount of energy remains the same if i have say lots of potential energy and 
I convert the energy to say potential energies down here now, there has to be some form of either more potential energy or kinetic energy to make up the difference here. Okay, so the energy can change forms, but the amount of energy remains the same, and that is called the conservation of energy. Okay, second law of thermodynamics maintains that a spontaneous process, a process that's just going to take place, actually increases randomness in the world. Okay, spontaneous process increases that randomness is called entropy or disorder. In the sense, are spontaneous. We're going to be looking at chemical reactions that are spontaneous or not spontaneous. The ones that go that are spontaneous are going to increase randomness, usually increase release energy. There's less um, ran or disorder in the world. Okay. So we're going to put this, I know it's kind of vague at this point, but we'll put this in context to what we're dealing with in physiology. And basically we're going to be looking at um, chemical reactions and how these thermodynamics are involved in the chemical reactions that are taking place in the body. Okay. These reactions... from energy transfer beef between molecules. Remember, we're saying that, say we got two atoms bonded together, there is stored energy, there is potential energy in those bonds. Okay, it can be stored up. If we break them, we can release, possibly release some energy. Okay, the reactions that we're gonna be dealing with the most here are gonna be combination, decomposition, reactions okay putting a and b together to make c or putting c or taking c and breaking it down to a and b okay what we said is those chemical bonds hold potential energy okay that potential energy in those molecules and those bonds is referred to as free energy you also refer refer to as gibbs free energy okay. it's the amount of potential energy in those bonds you can think in a sense that the more complex molecules the ones with many many different bonds have more bonds more complex and they would have more free energy okay whereas less complex molecules small molecules typically have less energy Okay, so keep that in mind. Because remember, our first law of thermodynamics is that energy must be conserved. So if we have a reaction that has a molecule that has a high amount of free energy, and we break it down to a molecule that has a low amount of free energy, that's the potential energy, there's a gap in energy there. So that gap has had to have been from somewhere else. Right, and so maybe some kinetic energy usually released as heat or so forth. That energy comes from a different source. Okay, so let's look at this as we're moving through and looking at energy transfers when we do our chemical reactions. So let's look at these reactions and the way energy transfer takes place in our endergonic reaction. Right, we can see our reactants are down here and what's on the x-axis is the potential energy of the molecules or the Gibbs free energy All right it is low here where the product has a higher amount of free energy okay so there's a difference in energy but remember our first law of thermodynamics is there has to be we have to conserve energy so there is a gap in potential energy here so there must have been some form of energy put in to make this take place. And so inorganic reactions require an input of energy. We must have an input of energy to go from low free energy to higher energy. Okay, a classic example of this is um, carbon dioxide in water, 
right? Very low complex molecules, less or less complex molecules. Okay. And so they have low free energy. They are put together to form glucose, this here. A more complex molecule. So this would be our CO2 down here, plus water. Okay. And this would be our glucose up here. In our case, what do you think the, this is what our plants do. They do this photosynthesis. Where does the energy come from? Right, in this case, it's solar energy from the sun. But there was an input of energy. There is a conservation. So this, this doesn't happen. There has to be some form of input of energy to make it happen. Okay. On the other end of the spectrum, we have exergonic reactions. Now we're going basically in reverse. We have a complex molecule going to less complex. Let's take the breakdown of glucose. We can take glucose and oxygen, and which is more complex, has a higher free energy. As you see here, more energy stored in these bonds here than in the bonds that we see in the products in our CO2 and our H2O. So there's a gap again. There's a gap in free energy, high free energy here, low free energy here. In that case, these reactions, energy is released. Okay? And that's what we're going to be doing today. We're going to be basically breaking down glucose. We're going to see, okay, breaking down glucose releases energy. Glucose breakdown releases energy. To make our ATP, say we have ADP plus phosphate. I, sorry, it's such a bit. That's on the low free energy. And our ATP is up here in higher free energy. So you can see here's glucose breakdown releasing energy as we break it down to CO2 and water. We can use this energy as input to fuel this ADP to ATP. Okay, so we're going to take this exergonic reaction that releases energy, breaking down glucose, and we're going to take the energy that's released and use it to build up to make our ATP molecules. All right, essentially that's what we're going after today. That is the whole gist of, it's a little more complex than that, but and lots of steps involved, but that is the gist of what we're going to. Breaking down glucose to release energy, to use that energy to make ATP. All right. Here is kind of that breakdown, how we break down glucose in combustion. Glucose plus oxygen gets broken down in one step, and you can see there is a large release of energy here. Okay. Whereas for us, we do a breakdown of glucose in many enzymatic steps. So each of these steps is going to have a separate enzyme. So you can see why we have to have so many genes to code for proteins because we got all these enzymes we got to use among other proteins. But just for a breakdown of glucose, we got many, many enzymes that we're going to need to require because we do the breakdown of glucose in many multiple steps. But along the way, we still release the energy difference is this, we're going from the same same reactants to the same products. So the amount of energy is released. It's just in our case, when we break down glucose, it's little by little energy release. Okay, It's not this big bang of energy. Okay. So what we're going to be focused on at the beginning of this lecture is taking us to here. Okay, multi-step process, many enzymes, and we're going to see there are these 
other oxidation reduction reaction uh, reduction reactions that are taking place that allows us to store some energy. All right, so here's kind of that showing you here is the breakdown of food, breakdown of let's just use glucose to CO2. All right, we're going from higher energy to lower energy, but that's fueling. ATP or ADP to ATP. Okay, so this exergonic re reaction is fueling this energonic reaction, going to higher energy. What we see happens in the cell is ATP broken down to ADP, right? This is an exergonic and it's going to release energy. The energy released by breaking this down can be used by the cells. To do their work okay but what we're focused on mainly is breakdown of this to fuel the production of ATP from ADP and phosphate you can see what we're doing here here is ADP the only difference between ADP and ATP is that this third phosphate group has been bound here key is is this bond right here this is a very high energy bond there's lots of energy stored in that bond so this is a good molecule to use because if we break that bond we get a big a good release of energy and the cells can use that energy to fuel whatever they need to take place okay but that's the general flow ADP boom synthesize we break down our glucose this our energy inputs from breaking down our nutrients to fuel this reaction and then the cells use the breakdown of ADP to release it to use for work all right but we got to go through the process of this breakdown of glucose how do we harness this energy from glucose as we break it down to be able to create our ATP molecule so as we do this process of breaking down glucose and there will be these reactions to because remember we're doing it multiple steps we're going to do like kind of those metabolic pathways Remember the metabolic pathways a goes to b this is from your enzyme lecture b goes to c d and each of these is an enzymatic step and we get these intermediates till we get to say the final product F all right many of these reactions are going to be oxidation reduction reactions all right and that a molecule either gets reduced and another molecule gets oxidized during the reaction okay these reactions are going to be coupled and this is how we're going to store some of the energies as we break down glucose we're going to be able to store down this energy because what oxidation and reduction mean is reduction is when an atom or molecule gains electrons it is reduced when it gains electrons Oxidation, on the other hand, is when an atom molecule loses an electron. Okay, oxygen doesn't have to be involved. Um, oxygen is a good acceptor of electrons. We'll see that later, but it can be any molecule it can be oxidized and reduced. We said these are coupled. For a molecule to be reduced, another molecule has to be oxidized. This oxidized molecule will be donating its electrons or transferring its electrons to the reduced molecule. Okay, so they are always coupled. Okay, from one molecule to lose an electron, it has to give it to another molecule. The electron just doesn't go off into space. Okay, so we have a reducing agent is one that is an electron donor. A reducing agent would get oxidized because it gives its electrons off an oxidized oxidizing agent would gain electrons 
right? So the other, it gets oxidized as it receives, or sorry, as the other molecule gets oxidized as it receives the electrons. Okay, so don't get that confused because it's kind of thinking in the reverse. Reducing agent donates electrons, it's reducing something, and an oxidizing agent is oxidizing something. All right? And many of the molecules, it can be reduced, and then that molecule can be oxidized. It can transfer its electrons to somewhere else. Okay, so a reduced molecule doesn't have to stay reduced. It can give off and reduce another molecule and become oxidized, but they are always coupled, these reactions. We will see electron, or sorry, oxygen is a great electron acceptor. Therefore, that's why it's called oxidation, but it doesn't have, these reduction oxidation reactions do not have to have oxygen involved. One caveat is usually the free electrons, electrons that are being passed along, don't just come as electrons to the new, the reduced molecule. The reduced molecule, UZ, the electrons are carried in hydrogen atoms. So usually when a molecule gets reduced, besides also picking up electrons, it also picks up hydrogen atom or atoms. Okay. And then when it gets oxidized, it loses that hydrogen. Okay, and we're going to see this in a bit. There are going to be two molecules that we are talking specifically throughout this process of breakdown of glucose in which they are getting oxidized and reduced. And those molecules are NAD, nicotamine, adenine, dinucleotide, right? Flavonin, flavin, adenine, adenine, dinucleotide. You'll, I will refer them as NAD, FAD, all right? But you can see these, ends, or these molecules are also coenzymes. So they're gonna be involved in those enzymatic steps of breaking down glucose, and they're acting as coenzymes. So if they're not available, the reaction cannot take place because you need those coenzymes for the enzyme to catalyze the reaction. In this case, these molecules are going to be either accepting electrons or donating electrons in our case. All right, NAD plus, it's its oxidized state. Remember, electrons usually don't come free, they come with hydrogen. So NADH is the reduced state. Here is those free electrons it picked up. Okay, so they are basically going to be carriers and trans transfers of electrons in our reactions. FAD. FAD picks up two electrons or picks up a pair of electrons. And instead of picking up just one hydrogen, it picks up two to FAD H2. This is its reduced state, okay? In the reduced state, FAD cannot pick up more electrons. It has to oxidize back to here before it can pick up electrons again, okay? So, and same with NAD. NADH, I can't pick up another set of electrons here, another pair of electrons there. Once I'm reduced, I can't be reduced again. All right, I have to become oxidized back to this state before I can get reduced again. So keep that in mind as we go through these reactions. All right, here's basically the coupling. Say this was a molecule in our step in breaking down glucose, one of our enzymatic step. We have a molecule HT, sorry, molecule X with two hydrogens here, and it has its reduced. This molecule loses its hydrogens with those electrons, and what happens to 
in AD. It becomes reduced. So this molecule becomes oxidized and this molecule becomes reduced. And so I said these, these NADH molecules are basically going to be like transfers of electrons for us. They're going to be electron carriers because the NADH now can become oxidized and it can reduce Y here. Now Y is reduced. Keep in mind electrons have energy, so that's the key point is we're going to be using these electrons. As we break down glucose, we're going to be catching electrons with our NAD, and later on we can use those electrons as an energy source to help make our ATP. Okay, but we got a ways to get there, but just keep in mind these reduction reactions when NAD here, we are picking up a pair of electrons. Okay, through I like to think of it as harvesting electrons as we break down glucose and we're harvesting the harvesters are our NADH or NAD that's getting reduced to NADH. Alright, so here's where we're going. I need you guys to memorize all of this, all of this, and all of this. I'm just kidding. We are gonna be going through the Krebs cycle, beta oxidation, um, gly glycolysis here. You can see there are multiple steps to breaking down glucose. All right? This is the breakdown. This, remember, glucose goes to carbon dioxide and water. To get there, we have to go through all these steps and all these steps of the citric acid cycle to get to carbon dioxide and water. All right, we are going to walk through these steps, but basically I want to think big picture of what we're doing here. Remember, what are we doing with breakdown of glucose? We're breaking down glucose to release energy. Okay, we're going to capture that energy and then we're going to use it to fuel the making of ATP. Okay, so that is what we're doing in these steps of glycolysis here. And the step of citric acid cycle is we are breaking down glucose to gain the energy released to be able to use it in the, down the line, okay? So let's begin our steps, and it begins with glycolysis. Okay, we're first going to go through anaerobic respiration. This is anaerobic, meaning there is no oxygen available. All right, glycolysis and lactic acid pathway. These reactions run without oxygen. We don't have to have oxygen available. We're going to see the step of that citric acid cycle or Krebs cycle and the electron transfer change further down. Those require oxygen. But glycolysis along with lactic acid pathways, these can occur without the presence of oxygen. Okay, and glycolysis is going to be our first step in breaking down uh, glucose. We're going to break it down glucose. We're basically going to take glucose, which is six carbon, and break it into two molecules of pyruvic acid, a three carbon molecule. Okay, so first we break and that is a nine step process. Um, all right, we're going to go through, but we're going to look big picture on what's taking place through this glycolysis. We're not going to go step by step. I will pinpoint if there's any enzyme or anything along the way for um, that you guys need to remember. But think big picture of what we're doing here. All right, so we overall. Before we get into glycolysis, let's touch on metabolism. Okay, we have metabolism broken up into anabolism and catabolism. You guys have probably all heard anabolic steroids, because what is anabolism? It's synthesizing larger molecules. And anabolic steroids, we're synthesizing more proteins, making muscles bigger. All right, not good to inject testosterone, but some people do it to do be able to build more muscle but anabolism is synthesizing a larger molecule 
In our case, you can think of it as ADP plus phosphate equals ATP. We're making a bigger molecule there. Okay, catabolism is breaking down larger molecules. In our case, we're going glucose, bigger molecule, breaking it down to CO2. Sorry, I'm not putting all the numbers here, but that is our basic breakdown, the CO2 in water. So, breakdown to release energy to be able to fuel these reactions that take energy, along with whatever our cells need our ATP for. Okay, so that's our overall view of metabolism. We already said catabolism is going to drive anabolism, which we've already discussed, in that we're breaking down glucose to be able to fuel the reactions to make ATP. Okay. As we said, there are many oxidation reduction reactions along the way as we break down glucose. Catabolism, if we want to break down glucose all the way to CO2 and water, we have to have oxygen. All right, and oxygen is going to serve as the final acceptor. We'll discuss that in a bit. But it's going to take the electrons. Okay. If we're able to go all the way, it's aerobic cellular respiration. That'll do glycolysis, which we're going to discuss first, which is anaerobic. Leads us to citric acid cycle, which is aerobic, and the electron transfer chain, which is aerobic. Okay. So that is where we're headed. And this is the large overview. Okay, again, remember, this, these two are considered aerobic, so we have to have O2 available. First breakdown glycolysis can happen without oxygen. Okay, where does glycolysis occur? It occurs in the cytoplasm. Okay, we can do anaerobic. We don't need oxygen for glycolysis or to do lactic acid pathway. These are the first two we'll discuss is without oxygen. All right, if we don't have oxygen, our products from glycolysis are going to go to lactic acid pathway. If we do have oxygen, then we lead into the next step, the citric acid cycle and then finally into the electron transport chain. Where do these take place? You always hear of the mitochondria called as the powerhouse. That is because citric acid takes place in what we call the matrix of the mitochondria. And the electron transport chain changes, happens on the membrane. Here is, say, our mitochondria. And what we find in our mitochondria is there is two membranes to the mitochondria, an inner membrane and an outer membrane. There is this inner membrane space. And what's inside the inner membrane is the matrix. And that is where your citric acid cycle is taking place. The electron transport chain is going to actually occur here on the inner membrane okay but uh, for our first step we got to get head into glycolysis again we don't have to have oxygen to make this take place all right this is anaerobic respiration it is part of aerobic because if we do have oxygen the products from glycolysis will enter into aerobic but if we don't have oxygen we're headed to that lactic acid pathway all right so let's begin our breakdown of glucose uh, we're going to start with the first step the first step is glycolysis again this is happening in the cytoplasm so all these enzymes are in the cytoplasm because we're going to be doing hopefully a nine-step process to break glucose down to 
what is called pyruvic acid, right? So we're going from a six carbon sugar glucose and breaking it down to a three carbon pyruvic acid. So basically we're gonna be breaking the glucose in half and creating two molecules of pyruvic acid or pyruvate. Okay, so that's the beginning and the final. Remember, we're doing these metabolic pathways, so that's the final product. Okay, we're going to be doing this in a nine step process. So we're going to go through this. Um, we'll see, I will point out the main steps we're looking at. One other thing to note as we do this glycolysis is you'll see, look at the numbers here on glucose. Right, we got 12 hydrogens here, but two times four is only eight. So we lose four hydrogens and you'll see why in that, remember when we do reduction oxidation reactions, usually those electrons are transferred with hydrogen. So we'll see along the way as we do glycolysis, we're gonna be reducing NAD. All right. Again, glycolysis, we can do this without oxygen. This is anaerobic. So we're going to do glycolysis, look at anaerobic as oxygen is not available. We'll uh, go glycolysis into the lactic acid pathway, right? But realize that if oxygen is available, glycolysis, the products of glycolysis, our pyruvic acid, ultimately will be brought into the citric acid cycle to further along break down glucose. Okay, but this is the first step. We can do this without oxygen. All right, so we can do this anaerobically. All right, glycolysis, again, nine step process. We can break it down into two phases. Okay, there is a preparatory or activation phase or stage. All right, this, as you can see, is Look at the reactions here. Okay, again, this metabolic pathway. So here's one, two, and we have these intermediates molecules along the way. Okay, but for the preparatory phase, look what we're doing. We're using ATP and going to ADP. So we're actually using up ATP. Isn't the whole process here to make ATP? That's the whole function or what we're going after with the cellular metabolism or cellular respiration, right? But in this, we gotta prep the molecule. We gotta prep the glucose. Here's glucose with our six carbons. And along the way, we are using up two molecules of ATP. So now we're at a negative two ATP. We're going in the reverse direction here. All right, but we got to activate this glucose molecule to be able to further break it down. At the end, we'll end up with dihydroxyacetone phosphate and glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate. This dihyd will actually be converted to glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate. So for this next stage of glycolysis, we're going to be bringing in two of these molecules for each glucose molecule. So remember, we make two of these out of each glucose molecule. All right, so what have we done here? We've used up two ATP. We've gotten ourselves down to two glyceraldehyde three phosphate molecules. Now let's look at the steps through here to get us all the way down to pyruvic acid. All right, again, this is just showing one molecule going through, but for each glucose, we have two molecules of glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. Okay. Let's see what we're doing here. Look at the overall reaction. And again, we got to times this by two, right? Because there are two molecules coming down. So we're going to run this reaction twice. During this enzymatic reaction going from here to here what do you see happening okay we are reducing two molecules of NAD 
In this step, we're making two molecules of ATP. All right? You'll hear where it's substrate or at the chemical level, making ATP during these reactions through our cellular respiration are called making it at the substrate level. Okay, we'll see at the end we're going to be doing what's called making ATP through oxidative phosphorylation, but through the substrate level, through these reactions, we can make ATP through the substrate level. And here we're making two. Further down the line here, you can see in this step we are making another two of ATP at the substrate level. Okay, so now we've made, let's count them, two. Four, but remember at the previous, the preparatory phase, we used up. We were negative 2 ATP. Okay, so overall, what do we end up with here? We got glucose plus 2 NAD, 2 ADP, 2 phosphate, and at the end, we end up with 2 pyruvate. We reduced 2 molecules of NAD8. And recreated from here, we ended up with a net of two ATP. All right, we have four here, but we used up two at the preparatory stage, so we got a net. This is the net of two ATP, the overall reaction. All right, so glycolysis, we go from glucose down to 2 pyruvate or 2 pyruvic acid. All right. We made 2 ATP. All right. This will not last us very long. 2 ATP is not going to be able to fuel your muscles for a long period of time or fuel all your neurons um, um, firing at a rapid succession. Okay. But watch here. What I do want to key you guys on is remember these NAD. What's the difference between this and this? All right, it's this step here. Reduce is that NAD picked up. We picked up two pairs of electron, pair of electrons for each molecule of NAD that we reduced. Okay, I like to think of this as harvesting electrons. Okay, through glycolysis and through citric acid cycle, you're going to see we're going to be doing these reactions and picking up electrons via NADH or FAD. Okay? And we're going to be able to use these electrons, have energy. We're going to be able to pick them up. And then later on, we're going to be able to use those electron energies to do some other work Okay, when we get to the electron transport chain. So keep this in mind. Keep this in the back of your head as this is an important step in that we are picking up these electrons along these enzymatic steps, all right? Because this here, this isn't going to do much for us. 2 ATP, yes, it gives us ATP, but it's not enough. We need a bigger payout, and we're going to see if we have oxygen, we can get ourselves a bigger payout, all right? So we've ended up here. We're at 2 pyruvate. We reduced two molecules of NAD. And we created 2 ATP. All right. If oxygen is available, we'll go to the citric acid cycle. But let's say oxygen's not available. All right. Oxygen's not available. All right. We're going to have to go to what's called the lactic acid pathway. But here's kind of the overview free energy, right? Glucose, we've activated it. And now we can break it down to pyruvate through those enzymatic steps. But look at what we've done. Along the way, we've 2 NAD, 2 ATP, 2 ATP here, right? But we used 2 here, so we got a net of 2 ATP. But again, I want to point out, more importantly, we got, we picked up electrons via reducing NAD. This is important. This is These electrons are important because we're going to be able to use the energy from those electrons to do 
work. So looking at the overall pathway here, okay, there's our preparatory. One enzyme I said I'd pinpoint where I would like you guys to know um, certain points, certain enzymes, right? I've made points of the NADH, made points of the ATP being produced during glycolysis. The one enzyme I do want you guys to recognize is this phosphofructose kinase one. Okay, kinase, so it's gonna add a phosphate to fructose, right? To phosphofructose, right? The key thing about this enzyme is this is the committed step. If we take our glucose in our cell and it makes it from here to here, all right, we do this step, glucose is committed to going through glycolysis. We can't send glucose anywhere else. We can't go back and send glucose somewhere else. It is committed to glycolysis at the step. Okay. If you remember our metabolic pathways, A, goes to B, B goes to C, goes to D. We have these intermediates, but if you remember, there's this end product inhibition, right? Say we want D, but we only want D in a certain amount. We don't want to have tons and tons of D over accumulation and cause problems or might not be beneficial to the cell. D can go back in allosterically inhibit the enzyme here. If we start building up lots of D, we can inhibit, if it allosterically inhibits this enzyme, it shuts down or slows down this pathway, right? One thing to notice about ATP is we don't have these great stores of ATP because if we had lots of ATP, right, just sitting around, ATP will actually revert back to ADP if it's sitting around for long periods of time. Okay, so we kind of have to make our ATP on demand. So we don't want to constantly be making ATP. So here is, since this is the committed set to glycolysis and this commits glucose going here and commits us into taking glucose and making ATP, if we have a substantial amount of ATP, we have enough, right? We don't want to keep making it and making these large stores. We want to inhibit the glycolysis pathway. To do that, we have the N ATP. If there's large amounts of ATP, ATP can al allosterically inhibit our phosphofructose kinase. So once we start building up stores of ATP, ATP starts binding and allosterically inhibiting our phosphofructokinase. And then that shuts down conversion of fructose 6 to this. And now we do not committing glucose to glycolysis pathway because then we just start making ATP that we're not gonna be able to use. All right, so remember phosphofructose kinase, that's the one enzyme through this pathway. I do want you guys to realize and why it's important because, all right, it's committed step and it also is a good point to inhibit because if we inhibit this step, glucose can be converted to other areas or to other purposes rather than going through glycolysis to make ATP. All right. Now, this was the part I was alluding to earlier in that glycolysis we end up with that pyruvate okay we haven't fully broken down glucose if we have oxygen that pyruvate we can bring it into basically citric acid cycle and continually continue to break down glucose right but that's if oxygen is available we're able to do aerobic respiration 
with oxygen. If oxygen is not available, we got to revert to anaerobic respiration, right? Remember glycolysis, we don't need to have uh, we don't need to have oxygen to make glycolysis run. And what is the function, the lactic acid pathway? All right. Lactic acid pathway, pyruvic acid. Okay. You can see what's taking place here. Pyruvic acid is getting converted to lactic acid. But the key step here is, what are we doing here? NADH is getting oxidized to NAD. And why is this important? Because okay. you can imagine, when does anaerobic, anaerobic say we're exercising, right? We're able to give enough oxygen to our cells, they're able to do aerobic. But at a certain point, we're not able to supply oxygen and we keep breaking down glucose from trying to make ATP, at a certain point, we don't have an infinite amount of this NAD, or sorry, NAD here. All right, if we're continually doing glycolysis, and we're in glycolysis, what do we do? In glycolysis, we do NAD, and we reduce it to NADH. So all our NAD at some point, will be in this form. If this is not available, remember this is a coenzyme for those reactions in glycolysis. Okay, we're breaking down. We got that reaction in glycolysis where NAD, okay, again, this is glycolysis, goes to NADH. If this is not available, then we can't, this reaction can't take place and we can't continue through glycolysis. We can't break down to make more ATP through glycolysis. So what is this allowing us to do? If we're able to revert NADH back to NAD, we can do this step and we can do another round of glycolysis. So this would allow us to, okay, if this pathway wasn't available, all we could do is glycolysis, get to ATP, and then we're shut down. But because this allows us to regenerate or oxidize our NAD back to NAD, now we can do glycolysis another round and we can pick up two more ATP, okay? Not super efficient, but it allows us to produce more ATP. Okay, here's kind of that pathway in regards to what we're looking at is this step here. All right. If that NAD is not available, we cannot do the step and glycolysis is shut down. So what the lactic acid pathway is doing is allowing us to boom, regenerate this molecule, right? Because glycolysis, we go, or sorry, lactic acid pathway, taking this and oxidizing to this. So now we have this coenzyme available to run this step in the glycolysis pathway and we can run glycolysis again and we get two more ATP, All right? So we don't get any ATP out of the lactic acid pathway. What lactic acid pathway allows us to do is to run glycolysis another round, okay? So it allows us to get two more ATP, All right? We'll see, this isn't super efficient compared to where we're going to go with this when we go to aerobic respiration when we have oxygen we're going to be able to break down glucose fully and we're going to be able to get the big payout we won't be stuck at 4 atp we're going to be able to get quite a bit more when oxygen is available 
All right, so let's get into the heart of this and to now if oxygen is available. All right, we've been through glycolysis. Glycolysis can take place without oxygen. Now, instead of going through the lactic acid pathway, when oxygen is present, we can do what's called aerobic respiration. Okay, aerobic respiration takes place when oxygen is present. This allows us to take products of glycolysis, bring them into citric acid cycle, and then ultimately to the third step, that electron transport chain. Okay, so let's walk our way through these steps. We'll walk our way through. First, we'll get into the citric acid cycle, see what's happening there, and then bring us into the electron transport chain, and we'll see what's taking place there. So the overall equation, if we're able to do, if we have oxygen, we're able to break down glucose fully into CO2 and water. All right, this is only if oxygen is available. If we don't have oxygen available, remember we just end up at two molecules of pyruvate. We end up with what we got at the end of glycolysis. Okay. This process, we saw that big boom, glucose to CO2 and H2O in combustion. There's all this lots of energy reduced, but we're doing it. All right, you saw glycolysis was nine steps. Now we're gonna be going through the citric acid cycle, which is multi um, metabolic pathway, multi-step enzymatic steps. All right, so we're just breaking glucose little by little until we get finally down to CO2 and H2O. Okay, remember, how do we start? Citric acid cycle, we ended up, or with glycolysis, we ended up pyruvic acid, reduced two molecules of NADH, and we have a big 2 ATP made. Okay, that pyruvic acid does not go directly into the citric acid cycle. We'll see it gets converted first to acetyl-CoA. Right, so that's the first step. Here we are at pyruvic acid. That happened in the cytoplasm. We're gonna move into the citric acid cycle, but remember, in the citric acid cycle takes place in the matrix, right? That pyruvic acid is out in the cytoplasm. So as it moves in to the matrix, that pyruvic acid is getting converted in to acetyl-CoA. Carbon dioxide is moved. So this is a three carbon pyruvic acid and we're creating a two carbon acetyl-CoA. So every time we cleave off a carbon in our citric acid cycle or this process, this isn't a part of it, this is before the citric acid cycle, we're moving from pyruvic to acetyl-CoA, we're producing CO2. This is where that CO2, the CO2 that we have to um, exchange at our lungs, we have to get rid of. This is how it's being produced. Okay. So here, convert to remove carbon dioxide, make acetic acid, and the acetic acid pines with coenzyme A to finally give us acetyl CoA. It's a two carbon molecule. Okay. One other thing I want you guys to really focus on here is what we do in this step. Besides making CO2, we also reduced another molecule of NAD. Okay. If we're keeping account of what we get from glucose, remember glucose, there are two of these made in glycolysis from glucose. So we'd have to Basically in this step from each glucose, we are doing, reducing another two molecules of NADH. Okay, what does this tell you? This tells you that we are picked up two more pairs of electrons, harvesting electrons. We're gonna harvest these electrons. So as we break down glucose, we're 
picking up these electrons on NADH and later on they can give off those electrons to allow us to do work all right allow us to bring them to the electron transport chain to do to use the energy from the electrons to do work so keep that in mind these these steps here is important this is worth AT, ATP to us at the end All right here's the actual steps here's our pyruvic acid cleaving off co2 binding together and we get our acetyl coa but key here too we're doing this twice for each glucose molecule and so we've picked up more electrons as we've done this step okay this is a step most people forget when we start doing the at the end we're going to do the counting for how many NADH to figure out how much ATP we can produce. This is kind of one of those steps that people forget. Don't forget this step. This is a step leading from glycolysis. It's like an intermediate step from glycolysis into the citric acid cycle. Okay, and as we do that, we produce CO2 and we're also okay, reducing two molecules of NAD for each molecule of glucose. all right so citric acid cycle here's our pyruvic we got acetyl coa and acetyl coa combines with oxal acetic acid a four carbon molecule and the combination of these two create our citric acid okay our citric acid and that starts, we're going to see, we'll look at this in more detail, this citric acid cycle. There are many enzymatic steps along the way, but you can see it's a cycle because as we go through, we have citric acid. As we go through, we end up back again with oxal acetic acid. Okay, I'll go over the numbers here that we get as we walk through this individually. Okay. So important events, basically when GTP is produced, but it donates it to ADP to form ATP. So we'll, for each acetyl-CoA going in, we get a molecule of ATP. We get three molecules of NAD reduced. And now here we see our FAD, we get one molecule of FAD. We will look at this where this is taking place on the citric acid cycle okay but again this happens twice so if we're doing a tally for glucose we got to say six two and two we got to double these but we'll do that here in just a sec so here's that acetyl coa coming right Converted from our pyruvic acid from glycolysis, right? Combines with oxal acetic acid, and we get citric acid to start our cycle. Okay. I don't need you to know all these different intermediates. I don't need you to know all the steps. What I do want you to realize is what are we doing here? So remember, two of these are going in. This is just showing you numbers for one round of the citric acid cycle for glucose we have two acetyl coas in so we're doing this two rounds for each glucose molecule okay what do you see happening here we're reducing molecule nadh or sorry nad here we're reducing nad here we're reducing FAD and we are also making ATP okay. and here another NAD so for each glucose right to acetyl-CoA from each glucose in the citric acid cycle we're reducing six molecules of NAD reducing two molecules of FAD and making two ATP. 
along the way you can also see okay, our CO2. We are making CO2 along the way and we end up with four CO2. So this is a CO2 that you guys, right, we expel in our lungs. We're breathing in oxygen so we can do the citric acid cycle, right, because we need oxygen to do our aerobic respiration. And as we do it, we are making CO2 as a waste product to be get rid of. Okay. But remember, we made two ATP net in glycolysis. And now through all these steps in the citric acid cycle, we've made another two ATP. So we're in the positive of four ATP at this point. Okay, that's just not going to cut it for your cells. Your cells need a bigger payout. What the key point is, is what do we do in these, as we did this, our electrons. Okay, we've, like I like to say, harvested electrons. Okay, as we broke down glucose, we're harvesting electrons. We're picking up these electrons because our NADH and FAD are going to be able to transfer those electrons to the electron transport chain. And now at the electron transport chain, we're going to be able to use the energy from these electrons to do work that will ultimately result in ATP being produced. So the electron transport chain. Remember we made through our reactions in um, glycolysis and citric acid cycle, we made ATP at the substrate level. At the electron transport chain, we're going to be making ATP through oxidative phosphorylation. We're going to phosphorylate ATP and we need oxygen to do it. Okay. Where is the electron transport chain? Remember our citric acid cycle is here in the matrix. We have all that NAD, reduce NADH, all our um, reduce FAD in here. Our here is the outer membrane of the mitochondria and the inner membrane. The electron transport chain sits microstase of the inner membrane here. All right. All of those reduced NADs are here in the matrix, right? We also bring the NADH from glycolysis in here. Okay, because what we're going to see happening is our electrons from our reduced NADH and FADH2 are going to transfer their electrons to the electron transport chain that are going to transport the electrons through this chain and use them to pump protons. We'll see this in just a sec. What you see the names here, I don't need you guys to memorize the names of these complexes that we're going to see in just a second. What I do need you guys to realize is there are these complexes and there's four of them along with ATP synthase. So don't get caught up in memorizing the names. What I want you to do is kind of see the overall picture that's taking place in the electron transport chain to be able to make our ATP. So the electron transport molecules, they pass electrons down the chain, right? Being reduced and then oxidized, reduced and then oxidized. Okay, it's an exergonic reaction. And we're gonna be able to use that energy from the electrons to do call pumping protons. Then we're gonna use that proton gradient to basically make our ATP. So let's just see this electron transport chain. Here is our citric acid cycle. We got all our NADH, FADH2 in here. All right. 
there are four complexes complex one two three four and this is just a shuttle here but what we're going to be doing is our nad are going to be able to transfer our electrons so when nad H gets oxidized, it reduces complex one. Complex one uses electron energy to pump protons. Okay. And transfer the electrons to two. Two can transfer them to three. Three uses complex three, uses the electrons energy to cause the pumping of protons. We get shuttled over to four, and complex four uses the energy from the electrons to again pump protons. So what are we essentially doing here is we're creating a high amount of protons out here and a low amount of protons here. Okay, remember our concentration gradients from our secondary active transport there is potential energy in those proton or in those concentration gradients here we have a proton gradient this large protein here on the membrane is our ATP synthase it is going to utilize the proton energy in that proton gradient to fuel the reaction to make ATP okay so again four complexes and atp synthase four complexes make our electron transport chain and we have our atp synthase here that's going to use the proton gradient formed by the electron transport chain to make atp here's kind of a better um, scenario on how things are taking place um, I like this a little bit better than what your guys' book has. But what you can see happening, here are the four complexes. Complex 1, 2, 3, and 4. This is what makes up the electron transport chain. Okay. Here is what's taking place, at least reaction-wise. The NADH is being oxidized and it's transferring its electrons Again, I don't need you to know the names. Um, you just need to know complex one, complex two, complex three, complex four is okay with me. But what I do want you to realize is it is a series of oxidation reduction reactions taking place to transfer these electrons. So how do they get transferred? They're getting transferred via oxidation reduction reactions between the complexes. First, NAD drops it off to complex one. Okay. Complex two, when complex one gets oxidized, it transfers its electron to complex two. When complex two gets oxidized, sorry, we're here, it complex three gets reduced. And then complex three goes to cytochrome C, cytochrome C gets oxidized and will reduce complex four. So it's this series of oxidation reduction reaction. What also you got to realize is when complex one is reduced, it has the electrons. It can't be re-reduced. It can't pick up more electrons. It has to pass the electrons down the line before it can get reduced. It has to be oxidized again before it can pick up more electrons from NADH. Okay. The other main component here is you can see what's taking place. Protons are being pumped from here. This is the matrix into the inner membrane space. All right, so that is the purpose of the electron. We're using, harnessing the energy in the electrons to allow these complex one. So listen to this, complex one, three, and four are protein pumps. You see complex two is not, All right? So 
we're using as we transfer the energy the electrons the energy from the electrons are being used to pump protons at these complexes all right one other key thing to note we've talked about oxygen this is why oxygen is important to make this all run here is your oxygen oxygen picks up the electrons from complex four right so the only way for complex four to be oxidized is for oxygen to accept those electrons and it gets formed into water okay oxygen plus those electrons remember the electrons if you come with hydrogen in this case those hydrogens and oxygen form water okay why is this important if oxygen is not available complex four is reduced and stays reduced remember if this complex is reduced it can't take electrons it can't be re-reduced okay it can't be reduced again until it is oxidized and to be oxidized it has to oxygen has to be available so if it can't be reduced the cytochrome can't be reduced again this can't pick up any more electrons complex two can't be reduced anymore and complex one can't be reduced and nadh cannot go and reduce complex one because they're already reduced well without oxygen accepting those electrons from complex four basically it shuts down the electron transport chain in turn it also shuts down the citric acid cycle because remember all our NADH will be as this and we need NADH as NAD all right so without oxygen accepting the electrons from complex four here these all stay reduced they can't pick up more electrons there's no transport of electrons and what does that mean there is no more pumping of protons okay because when we have the electrons being transported through the electron transport chain that allows us to pump the protons and make the proton gradient high and protons here low and protons here okay we have this gradient now with oxygen available we're able to pump the protons use that electron energy to pump the protons high protons here low protons here right where would the protons want to go if they can come they can move they would want to go from high to low we have that potential energy stored in that gradient okay why does we matter it's because that protein that other protein that atp synthase is going to use that proton gradient that energy in the proton gradient to make atp out of adp the energy in the proton gradient fuels our reaction our endergonic reaction to make our atp Okay. Again, we'll stress the function of oxygen. Oxygen is that final electron acceptor. Okay, without it, the process halts. We can't re we can't continually reduce those complexes, and so they stay reduced, and we can't move electrons through. Without moving electrons through, we can't pump the protons. And if we don't pump the protons, we don't have a proton gradient. Right? And we're going to see that proton gradient we need to be able to make the ATP. All right, so let's see why that proton gradient is important. Here is that ATP synthase protein. See, it almost is on this here, and it kind of ratchets. So each time a proton moves through, it ratchets, and that energy used from protons moving through the ATP synthase allows us to enough energy to convert 
ADP to make our ATP. Okay. There is this giant gradient formed. Okay. H can only move through this ATP synthase. Okay, that movement across the membrane. And what we're going to see is it takes roughly about three movement of three hydrogens through here. And we can convert one molecule of ADP to ATP. All right. This theory of taking that, using that hydrogen gradient to make ATP is called the chemoosmotic theory. The whole process of using of the electron transport chain with ATP synthase is called oxidative phosphorylation. We're making um, making the ATP through oxidative phosphorylation. The chemoosmotic theory is just essentially that the proton gradient is what's being used to fuel as the crust for making ATP here. All right, so let's bring it to its conclusion, at least for glucose here. Remember, we made ATP through the substrate level. So let's see our balance sheet. Substrate level, if you remember, we made two ATP in glycolysis. We made two ATP for each glucose molecule in citric acid cycle. Through those enzymatic reactions, we made four molecules of ATP. These are always there. In oxidative phosphorylation in the electron transport chain, okay, theoretically, this is theoretically, I'm gonna use what's called actual, we'll see that in a bit, but each NADH yields about three ATP. So every NADH that drops its electrons off at the complex one, those electrons from the NADH should yield us roughly around three ATP. The electrons that we've harvested via FAD is going to yield us rough, theoretically, 2.1. Right? There is some energy needed to move molecules around and so forth, so I'm going to use what we call the actual yields. Actually, we probably get about 2.5 ATP for each NADH and 1.5 ATP. Okay. So now we can use these numbers here because we know how many NAD we made through glycolysis and through citric acid cycle as well as converting uh, pyruvic acid to acetyl-CoA and we know how many of these we've made per glucose. So we can use these and multiply how much we've made of these by these numbers to theoretically give us how much ATP. Again, we're going to use actual, so our number is going to be a little bit lower than what we find with the theoretical. Okay. So NAD, here's the actual yields because it takes energy. So this is what, if I was to give you an exam, I would ask you what actual is. So these are the numbers you need to know for FADH2 and NADH. What's the yields? What's the payout at the electron transport chain for each of these molecules we bring in there? Okay. And so glucose to pyruvate. Let's take each step and give us our accounting on where we get our numbers. Okay, again, this is for glucose. Remember, glucose yields us two acetyl-CoA molecules that go into the citric acid cycle for each glucose. But glucose to pyruvate, we gained two net ATP at the substrate level. Okay. 
but we create it to NADH. I will allow you to keep it as NADH, even though it, most of it goes into the mitochondria as this. All right, to NADH. Remember, what is this worth? These are going to go to the electron transport chain. What is this worth at the electron transport chain? Each of those is worth an actual yields roughly around two and a half ATP. Okay, so that is that number there. Two and a half ATP per NADA, NADA reduced, and we had two of them for glucose, so we get roughly five ATP for the NAD produced or reduced at during glycolysis. Pyruv when we convert pyruvate to acetyl CoA, again we have two per glucose. 2NADH, what's their worth at the electron transport chain? Two and a half, so again, two times two and a half, pick up another five ATP. Okay. Citric acid cycle, again, times two because two acetyl CoA go into the citric acid cycle from, um, from uh, each molecule of glucose. Also, we made two. ATP, right? For each acetyl CoA, it's three. We got a times by two, and here's our numbers that we get from each glucose molecule. All right, how much is this worth at the electron transport chain? Again, two and a half times six, because there's six here, and we have 15 ATP. And our FADH2 right? times two. Or these are worth how much are these worth at the in actual yield one and a half times two so we got three let's put this all together 18 plus what five that's 10 so we got roughly 28 ATP through oxidative phosphorylation plus our four ATP here we end up with Okay, 32 ATP. All right, so you can see with oxygen available, we have a bigger payout. Okay, we have a bigger payout. One other thing I want to note here is, I don't have the sheet, but is why is this different okay I'm going to draw a very poor electron transport chain there's number four three one and two should go like this two all right why are the numbers different for FAD and NADH if you remember, where does NADH, NADH drops its electrons off at complex one. All right, where's FAD, complex two. So FAD goes here, NADH here. The electrons that NAD donates to electron transport chain fuels this pump, which we get roughly four hydrogens pumped per pair of electrons. The NADH electrons also fuel three, complex three, another four protons, and NADH electrons also fuel four we get roughly about two protons pumped. So for NADH, we get ten protons pumped. If you remember at our ATP synthase, how many A protons had to move through to fuel the making of one ATP? We needed three, so roughly 
we get three ATP out of those 10 protons that the NADH. All right, where FAD only fuels three and four. The electrons at FAD don't go back to one to fuel its pump. It only fuels the pumps at three and complex three and four. So FAD results in only six protons. And what's that worth? If every three proton going through is worth an ATP, then we're only worth roughly two ATP plus with actual yield, one and a half ATP. So that is why there's a difference between those NAD and FAD when we get, take them to the electron transport chain to do our oxidative phosphorylation. All right, this is the detailed account. Again, I'm gonna use actual yields. Not theoretical. So the numbers you need for your NAD and FAD are right there. Okay, this is for glucose. Here's our first part. We're ending up our first part. We've broken down our glucose. We've gone in our anaerobic and aerobic cellular respiration. All right. Now we're going to interconvert part two. We're going to interconvert glucose. See what happens when things change in the body where glucose can go or where we can get it from. Also, we'll look at breakdowns of fatty acids, lipids, and looking at uh, some amino acid um, metabolism for part two, right? But this is the big thrust of it. We got about, this is about two thirds of what um, the topic's about. So uh, the other lecture will be a little bit shorter for you. All right. I will see you on the next one.